pleasure to be here and I really appreciated the warm welcome when I arrived. I feel like I'm in fairyland here. <laughs> I don't know how you feel, but it feels quite enchanted, quite magical. The little lights along the paths coming in, into the room and uh, it really sets the scene, sets the ambiance. And um, it's more than just a beautiful retreat centre. It's more than just, hopefully, a pleasant week ahead. You're giving yourself a gift to awaken by choosing to be here. You're giving yourself a gift to actually put into practice what the Buddha advised us to do. The reason that he taught was for the sake of the awakening of living beings, for the freedom of all suffering, of all living beings. And this is one of the big differences between how I understand Buddhism and other religions. He's looking towards the end of all suffering, not just a little bit, not just even the suffering of this realm, of, the, uh, of our lives as human beings, but even the suffering of the heaven realm. <laughs> this is going a bit deep too quickly, perhaps. <laughs> you first got to get to those heaven realms, right? <laughs> There's something called the heaven realm of the 33, the Tushita realm, which is the realm of the happily contented. And there's at least 33 of us, so we can see if we can at least get to that realm in this <laughs> retreat. But the purpose of the practice of loving kindness is not just a kind of balm on the wounds. It's not just to make us feel better, to bring more love into our lives and our hearts and into the world. But it's actually a, a way, a means to fully free the heart from anger in particular, but all the root causes of our suffering, greed, hatred, and delusion itself. So loving kindness, in my um, understanding, can take us all the way, and hopefully this will become clear as we progress on in this retreat. I'll explain how it's connected with the Eightfold Path right from the outset. It's not only uh, a sign of very deep wisdom, the enlightenment wisdom of a Buddha, but it's also the motivation with which we should approach our practice as well. Um, because the Buddha said that real, genuine, authentic spiritual practice has to be aimed at the benefit of ourselves and all other beings. He said that it's worthwhile to practice just for ourselves, but the best is to practice for ourselves and for others. And you might be interested to know that the worst kind of practice is just for others. <laughs> right? The Buddha said this. So this is your justification to indulge in the practice of meditation to benefit yourself this week, knowing that the practice of metta in particular is always aimed also at the benefit of others, very clearly from the beginning. And it's one of the reasons I love this practice, because it's a kind of giving. Just by the practice, you're already not only purifying your heart, but bringing more love into the world. And it will touch the lives of those around you here and also when you leave this place. You know, the Buddha said even animals uh, trust you. They feel safe around you when you have a lot of loving kindness. You know, even the uh, invisible beings protect you. And you're going to need that because there could be some bears. Who knows? You could befriend the bears too. That's what we call bear awareness. <laughs> this is terrible, but I'm conditioned by our general round. So I don't know if there's anything like cougar awareness or not. But um, anyway, all the furry creatures become your friends because they feel that there's nothing to be afraid of. And so often we get into conflict with other people in our lives because we have a kind of fear and a mistrust. And that brings out those very qualities in the other that we're afraid of, right? Because if people feel that you're judging them, you're kind of afraid of them, you're not sure what they're going to do next, then they also become very much on edge and they don't quite know how to act around you. But one of the ways that my teachers train me is to offer me his complete trust and respect, which kind of blew me away. This is before he knew anything about me or my past or, or my strange idiosyncrasies and you know, less than perfect uh, precepts because I don't think there's anyone in this world who has completely perfect precepts, right? But we put such high standards on ourselves. But he, as a teaching means and also as an indication of his purified mind, gives people trust and respect. 
before they even had to earn it or deserve it or prove themselves in any way. And I've noticed, as he has, that this creates a very beautiful community because people tend to live up to that. When you offer people trust, you offer them respect, you offer them kindness, you know, you basically treat them as precious, fragile human beings or animal beings who, just like you, seek happiness and recoil from pain, then they tend to relax, they tend to want to live up to that trust, want to live up to that respect. And um, it brings out the best in everybody. So you're here, I hope, to take steps on this wonderful path to awakening. And uh, one of the first steps on that path is the step of virtue, living an ethical life. And I thought I would introduce the precepts for people who might like to take them this evening. I'm hoping most of you, if not all of you, will take the five precepts. Um, and if some of you wish to take the eight, I will explain what that entails. That does entail renunciation of dinner. <laughs> so if you think that's going to be difficult, if you've got health conditions, like I have too, actually, chronic gastric condition then uh, be kind to yourself, because kindness is the heart of all these precepts, right? There's no virtue without kindness. Kindness is uh, what underlies all virtuous behaviour. So it's not only an abstinence, although the precepts are chanted and, and given in a sort of uh, abstinence kind of way, you know, I will undertake the training to abstain from taking life, for example. But on the contrary, on the other side of that means... I will do my best to protect and cherish and nurture life. So when you take these precepts, try and think of the opposites as well. So if you see a little creature in your room, I've got plenty in my room, the little, um, I forget what the elders, elder bogs or something. So they're obviously very wise, because in, in monastic life, you're only an elder after 10 years. So they must be really, like, far on the path, I don't know. <laughs> Into jhanas already, I don't know. So these little creatures, you know, they're very afraid, they're very timid, they're very uh, fragile little beings. Imagine if you saw a being like 2,000 times bigger than you, it would be like completely terrifying. So we can actually take care to, you know, see that little creature and just remove it from a place that it might get squished or, you know, somewhere outside maybe it prefers. Or sometimes they prefer to be inside, don't they, where it's warm. <laughs> I mean, it's okay, as long as they don't kind of crawl across from the house in the evening. I don't know. Once that happened to my mom, she came to see me in Thailand, and she was terrified of cockroaches. So we had our mosquito net on, but then in the night... <laughs> my poor mom. She suffered a lot for my Buddhist path. <laughs> but anyway, even the, even the cockroach got away unscathed. So we can, we can actually try to protect and nurture life, and that also means looking out for one another. So even though we'll be in silence, even though we'll be working as though alone, we can still smile. I, it's a shame, that's why I said I have to smile for everybody, because <laughs> I can't see your smiles, but hopefully if we all uh, wear our masks and look out, out for each other, try and protect one another from any potential virus, then we'll be able to uh, smile uh, with our mouths from one day. But even otherwise, you can smile with your eyes. You can smile by just gently opening a door for somebody or, you know, recognising that there is somebody nearby that um, maybe you want to step aside for and let them through. Or maybe they look to be in a hurry because they've got duty, washing up duty or something like that. And uh, just give them the benefit of the doubt. Perhaps that's why they want to go ahead in the queue. So we can be kind to each other and create a beautiful, safe space for the practice in all of these ways. And then the second precept is uh, not taking what is not given. So sometimes that's translated as stealing, but it really means not taking anything if you're not sure it's for you. And of course, the other side of that is not just uh, living simply, but also being generous, being really generous, not only with your um, time or finances, but also generous in the way you view others. Again, giving them the benefit of the doubt. If somebody's behaving a little bit strangely, don't jump to conclusions, you know. Like you, maybe they're having a hard time. A lot of people on this retreat, but in the general society, are suffering with anxiety, with depression, 
we don't know what other people are going through, you know. If we knew, I'm sure, we'd be so much kinder. And if we could see ourselves through someone else's eyes, how much kinder would we be to ourselves? So try to practice that kindness, that generosity of spirit towards others here and towards yourself as well so that you become a loving companion to yourself, to your heart, to your whole range of emotions, mental states, uh, physical bodily feelings. Can we be in loving companionship with all of those? At least try. At least tell your body and mind that you have that intention to really care. I'm kind of extending these a bit beyond them, but <laughs> I think it's all connected. So the next one is um, abstaining from sexual misconduct. But I think all of us here can probably take the precept of abstaining from sexual conduct altogether because we're all going to be celibate on this retreat. We're not going to indulge in any kind of sensuality or sexuality, even with ourselves, so that we can really start to tap into the happiness that comes from the mind. Yeah? We're moving slowly away from the world of the five senses, without condemning the pleasure of the five senses in any way. We can enjoy beautiful sights, delicious, nourishing food, understanding their purpose, understanding that these are supports for the practice, supports for the mind. But we can also start to tune into a different kind of happiness that comes from simply being good. And I don't mean this in some kind of snotty, superior kind of religious way. I, I can't really say anymore that I'm not religious, but I'm actually not. <laughs> so in ancient India, there were two kind of choices in life. You could be a householder, own a house, maybe have a family, a livelihood, or you could be a samana, which meant a kind of recluse uh, or an ascetic, usually a wandering ascetic. And these were the two life paths. And in the Buddha's time, he spoke a lot against religions, in fact, and spoke... Uh, more about the renunciation. So it's not about being uh, holier than thou, you know. I'm, I'm probably not holier than most people here. I just have certain training precepts and have undertaken a little bit more restraint and renunciation. But, uh, but this is for the sake of understanding the happiness of the mind. And sometimes the happiness of the mind is obscured by the sensuality, by the indulgence in the senses. And sometimes you can experience this on retreat. You might be having quite a peaceful, pleasant state of mind. And then you just think, oh, actually, I've done this before. Oh, it's five o'clock now, six o'clock, and monastics are allowed a piece of chocolate, dark chocolate. And whatever you're allowed, you know, becomes quite an indulgence. <laughs> <laughs> so you go to some monasteries and they have like three types or four types or like six bars. And it's like, whoa, OK, bring it back, <laughs> bring it back a bit. But one time I was having a lot of what we call piti sukha arising, like joy and happiness of uh, meditation born of starting to become still, the mind starting to uh, wake up and become more empowered with mindfulness, with brightness, with clarity. And I thought, oh, I'll have a piece of chocolate, even though I didn't really want it, it was like a habit. And when I had it, it was like such a coarse sensation. It actually wasn't that pleasant. But what it did do was distract me from the pleasure in my mind. And then I realized what the Buddha meant by unblemished happiness. He talks about the happiness that's away from the five senses as unblemished. Because just turning on that sense of taste at that time felt like an unnecessary agitation on the inner peace. So obviously when we're talking about sexuality, that's at a much coarser level, so we try to abstain from that. And yeah, I mean, you might have different energies arise in the body and the mind, but see if you can relate them to the practice that you're doing, to the meditation that you're doing. And keep it in the heart, keep it in the extremities as much as you can. And then the next uh, training guideline or training precept is to abstain from false speech, which should be very easy. Um, <laughs> you don't all look like you're about to have a good old chat. <laughs> and this is one of the benefits of a silent retreat. Your sila, your virtue, is automatically elevated because there's very little opportunity to break it. So if you do have to break into speech for any particular reason, usually not with one another, but with a member of staff or with myself, or perhaps even in the group interviews we'll be having, 
uh, starting from the day after tomorrow. See if you can just speak from your own experience. You know, speak in the first person, speak with what's a direct experience for you without too many evaluations about what's happening. And just in moderation, just say what needs to be said to convey the message you need to get across. And see that the speech is kind, is gentle, and is timely as well, right? So not to speak to someone when they're obviously in a hurry or um, carrying the dishes through into the kitchen or whatever it is. So, and of course, that can be internalized into inner speech. And another beauty of loving kindness, which I'll talk much more about in the second talk tomorrow, but one of the beauties of it is that we use a kind of internal monologue, like an um, so internal speech, to start to generate intentions of loving kindness in our minds. And gradually, this is almost like the vitaka, it's like the first stage of meditation when we're putting our mind to an object. So the object at first is the phrase. And, uh, and this immediately displaces any unwholesome thoughts. I mean, isn't that quite astounding, you know? The Buddha said when you have a thought of loving kindness, it's impossible to simultaneously have a thought of ill will. Yeah. That easy. And we might say, well, we're just faking it, I don't really feel it, you know, but over time that becomes sustained and the mind starts to really chime in, in a way, with the meaning of those phrases, and you may start to experience, I'm sure many of you may start to experience, an associated feeling or emotion, usually felt in the body, sometimes in the area of the chest, and it can be different for everyone, it will be different for everyone at different times, right? So, even less sense than comparing with one another, I mean, that is the most crazy thing to do, but we can't even compare with ourselves. We can't say, well, in the last sitting, I felt all peaceful and blissful, and now it's all kind of gone flat. This is just the nature of the mind. It's the nature of the practice. And you don't get the payoff every sit. A lot of it is just the patience, the planting seeds, the continuing to care about the quality of your attention, the quality of your mind, and care putting care into the way that you say those phrases, really meaning what you say. And this gently directs the mind towards the experience of loving kindness. So that's how the speech can be uh, very, very skillful and become uh, a deepening of virtue as well. Wow, I didn't think we'd talk all about loving kindness just by the five precepts, but... You know, if you're practicing loving kindness, it's almost impossible to do anything that harms oneself or another, which is essentially what precepts are for, right? They are harmless ways of behavior. And then the fifth one is to abstain from uh, any kind of intoxicants or drugs, including alcohol, that, that cause heedlessness and uh, obscure the clarity of the mind. So here we're trying to develop clarity of mind, mindfulness or awareness, or uh, caring attention. There are many ways to translate the word sati. Um, it also means a kind of recollection, remembering why we're here. We're here to get awakened, basically. We're here to wake up. We're here to come out of delusion. We're here to undermine those forces in the mind that create so much suffering for ourselves and other people. And we can do this in every moment, right? It's not like... You're either awake or you're asleep. It's like every moment can be a moment of clarity. So abstaining from this, which you'll be doing automatically here, uh, just helps that mindfulness to grow. And once it really grows and you get some benefit from meditation, the last thing you want to do is go and cloud your mind, you know. It takes so much work to clean it out of all this rubble that we've been putting inside. When I first started meditating, oh, 28 years ago, yeah. I'm getting old now. <laughs> uh, well, I should be enlightened, right? 28 years. <laughs> the Buddha said, in no long time, he said that to his disciples in his day, and in no long time could mean decades. So we're all right. But anyway, when I first started meditating, it took two to three years 
to not have a permanent jukebox in my mind. And it wasn't only Led Zeppelin, darn it. It was also <laughs> terrible pop music, <laughs> which I didn't even think I knew, and it was going on and on and on. And this is what happens, you know, we put so much clutter into our mind, the last thing we want to do is kind of add to it, either through speaking or looking at our phones or, you know, taking intoxicants of any kind. And then, for those who are really brave, I don't know how many this might relate to, how many people would like to be on eight precepts, which means abstaining? Wow, amazing, even this side of the room. Oh, it's this side, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> if your karma was to be on this side. You <laughs> no, no, no. It's not like that. I, I also have to have some oats in the evening because I have chronic gastric condition and it's perfectly fine, especially if it's your first retreat. Uh, or even if it's not, to, to not abstain from food in the evening, but just to go moderately with that. So for those who would like to, um, it just helps you to get in touch with what your body really needs as opposed to what you fancy, you know, a bit of whatever because it's going. Um, and you might find it's not enough, in which case you have to adapt and adjust what you eat for breakfast and what you eat for lunch. Um, but the purpose of that rule, really, in, uh, in the monastic training at least, is so that we can devote all of our afternoon and evening to the practice of meditation without needing to be bothered with thinking about food. Because the body doesn't really need so much when we're sitting a lot, when we're walk walking meditation, and when the mind is, or the brain, is consuming less energy. The needs for material uh, food tend to diminish. So uh, that's usually the easy one, in a sense. The next ones are also easy, so you've got it made. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so the next one is just to abstain from like um, cosmetics, makeup, jewellery, shows. I hope nobody's planning on sneaking off to a rock concert. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, entertainment, adornments, perfumes as well. Um, we spoke about not having uh, very scented cosmetics, if at all possible. You can exchange them for some uh, neutral or natural scented items here. Uh, so this is just not to try to make the body something that it's not, you know. There's nothing inherently beautiful. There's nothing inherently ugly about the body. It's just body, you know. This was one of the aims of mindfulness, the satipatthana of the body. Just to understand that this is just body. There's nothing here really worth attaching or clinging to. Of course, we can really um, treat our body with a lot of respect because it's our vehicle for the practice, right? And we have to treat ourselves very kindly to keep it healthy, to keep it well, to learn what your body needs, what its own particular requirements are, which will be completely different from anyone else's. And, um, and that, you know, the body is a beautiful, in a way, object of our caring attention. We can practice caring attention with our body and find out what kind of attitudes actually relax us and what kind of attitudes actually exacerbate pain or tightness or stress. So it's an incredible vehicle for the practice and it teaches us so much about our emotional state as well. Um, so please, even for those on eight precepts, make sure you keep the spirit of this precept and if you're not eating in the afternoon, make sure your body is not unduly under stress because of that. Yeah. So yeah, the adornment, yes, we were on adornment and um, beautification, so we're being honest here, right? I've been honest. Actually, I'm not honest. I've got lots of grey, but every time that it comes, I can shave it off. It's a really great way to avoid hair dye, actually. <laughs> but anyway, no, no dyeing your hair, no wearing makeup and jewellery and all that stuff, because you just don't need to, and what a relief it is, you know? Nobody's looking at you as a sexual object. You don't have to try and impress anybody. You know, nobody even knows what's going on in your mind. Aren't you glad about that? <laughs> you know, I'm really glad. I remember my first retreat in 1996, and I thought, wow, you know, I don't have to look at anyone, speak to anyone. I'm actually free of all those social obligations and kind of, you know, that stress and pressure that you hardly notice it because it's there your whole life, of just trying to kind of be something for someone. You don't even know who that person is. 
And in a place like this, nobody cares about what's going on for you. They're completely obsessed with what's going on for themselves. So this is a really wonderful support for that, and you just save a lot of time. Men as well, I'm sure. <laughs> and then the last one is to abstain from using high and luxurious beds and seating places. I guess this is, lit. This is not too high. And the beds here are all fine. Sometimes people take that to an extreme, and even in my monastery I've seen people um, decide to just sleep on the carpet instead of in the bed. Um, there's no need. <laughs> it just means that you're not kind of living in a more ornate or luxurious way than the average person, right? For monastics, my teacher likes to teach us, uh, we shouldn't be living at a standard that's higher than our average supporter, for example. So, you know, a, a moderate amount of comfort is okay. And I don't know about in the US, there may be slight differences, but generally I think as people living in so-called Western or, mm, how would you call it? I don't like the word developed, materialistic, capitalistic society, <laughs> where there's a lot of goods on offer, too much. We tend to think we're a bit indulgent, but actually we can be quite austere. We can be quite hard on ourselves. You know, there's probably like more eating disorders, and I know that's psychological too, but it stems from a kind of hard attitude that we have to ourselves, you know? We really like to push ourselves and give ourselves a hard time. We've been conditioned that way, right? To find the fault, to improve, to be better than the next person, better than our own best. It never ends. So, um, yeah. Just see if you can be really kind and enjoy the fact that you're here for yourself, you're here to understand the way your mind works and develop that kindness. And it starts just by having a beautiful attitude of kindness, of gentleness, of contentment as well with your own mind, your own body, with all its aches and pains, its particular diseases or injuries from the past. You know, no bodies are perfect, but there's a lot about our bodies that are absolutely fine that are working brilliantly. And isn't it amazing that we've got this opportunity to, to practice? We're still well enough, you know, to, to really make the best use of this human life. And also, I just want to remind everyone that we're here with the most wonderful group of people. How many people right now in the whole world have decided to spend the next week, and there will be people other than us, just cultivating beautiful qualities of mind that are going to benefit themselves and others for the sake of alleviating the suffering of themselves and others and really contributing to the harmony and peace in this world. It's an incredible intention and it's important to remember that you're one of those people. Yeah? So this retreat is not about the experience you have, it's not about blissing out in metta, although great, Accept it if it happens. <laughs> but it's not about the experience you have. It's about the care that you approach the practice with and the quality of your mind, the qualities that you bring to the practice, the qualities of giving, the qualities of uh, gentleness, of patience, of um, yeah, being content. You know, being content with whatever is happening at this moment. And that is the way that you get deeper in the practice. So, um, I had wanted to say a bit more about the retreat, but perhaps we should now take the precepts. Would that be a, a good time for that? Hopefully you're all inspired. And even to just repeat these precepts and understand what they mean is already strengthening your virtue. You're making an aspiration, you're making a determination. The intention's becoming uh, so strong that it forms your speech. So let's uh, chant together. And I will do the Pali chanting, but I'll, I think I've explained the meaning. So if you still have questions, you can ask. Um, we'll do the Pali chanting, and I'll lead, and you can just follow on after me. Okay? So firstly, we're going to pay respect to the Buddha and take refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. That's the qualities of the Buddha. That's the awakening, uh, the wisdom and compassion, the peace of the Buddha, that we all have the potential to, to um, cultivate and perfect. And the Dhamma is the practice, the path that you taught to the end of suffering. It's basically virtue, stillness, and wisdom. 
compassion's there too, always. And then the Sangha, which really means the community. And in the Buddha's day, it did mean the community of monks and nuns, but the assembly, the fourfold assembly, related to all people. So we can uh, roughly understand the word Sangha to mean all those who are practicing together. So if we take refuge in those qualities, it helps us to bring them up and uh, bring them to fulfillment in our heart. So I'll chant Namo Tassa three times. And then you'll follow three times, okay? Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambodasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambodasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambodasa Namo Tassa So what I'll do is chant the first two, and then the third one kind of changes. But also, you could all chant it. Maybe it makes sense that everybody chant the third one, which is basically to abstain from any sexual conduct. I guess that relates to everybody, whether you're on the five or the eight. And then I'll add the three extras for the eight preceptors. 
Panati Pata. Vikala Bojana So may you keep these five precepts or eight precepts for a good destination, which might mean a good destination right now in your mind. Hopefully there's some happiness there. And for your wealth, however you wish to interpret that, hopefully your spiritual wealth. And for the attainment of Nibbana, the full ending of suffering and the full ending of greed, hate and delusion, the highest happiness of Nibbana. So how is your energy now? Still good? Still good? I'm aware some of you might have traveled, like myself, but I don't know, it's always inspiring to be with a group of meditators. It feels like we're entering a beautiful journey together. So I'll speak a little bit more, not too much more about the uh, loving kindness, because we'll get into that tomorrow. But. Uh, Maybe just to touch on some of the things we'll approach. 
how we'll approach the practice in the next uh, six days or so. And I guess the most important thing first for me to say is that all of these practices and suggestions and guided meditations are just invitations. They are um, suggestions, guidances, invitations, really, for you to um, take if they are nourishing for you and experiment with, right? Not one thing will work for everybody and not one thing will work even for you all of the time. So please approach it in a way that it's almost like a smorgasbord of delicious edibles or, you know, in this case, like mentally edible, beautiful things uh, to eat. But if you eat too much of one thing, you get sick, no matter how delicious it is. So um, we're going to focus mostly on loving kindness and loving kindness not only as a cultivation which is the formal practice, you know, using those phrases and the emotion of loving kindness to really develop the feeling, the mood, the, the um, even create your character more inclined towards loving kindness. You know, we actually can transform our brains, that's been proven by uh, neuroscience, and therefore our general patterns of behavior, our characters through the cultivation of this. And the Buddha said, you know, that it is possible to train the mind in this way. And if it wasn't, he wouldn't ask us to do it. Because it is possible, he advises us to do it. So anyone can do it. You don't have to have special qualities. It is a practice, it is a cultivation, and it can be trained. It can become a choice that we make from moment to moment. But also, we're going to have another mode of practice, which is to use that loving-kindness as a kind of uh, disposition or way of looking at our experience, a way that we relate to our inner world. Because sometimes we won't be having feelings of loving-kindness or even thoughts of loving-kindness. In fact, you might have a lot of angry or irritable thoughts. Um, they might be projected towards the teacher, <laughs> or they might be projected towards one another. Whoever they're projected towards is really irrelevant because it's just the way the mind behaves from time to time. And if there's anger there, if there's irritation there, it will find something to be irritated about. So at those times, the loving kindness becomes the way that we relate even to those unwanted states of mind. Can we be kind even to them? Can we see that they're just calling for our attention, for our care, for our compassion, right? Because it's suffering once we get into difficult states of mind, you know, it hurts us. So at those times, and the rest of the time as well, we can practice just regarding our experience with kindly eyes. And these are phrases straight from the Buddhist texts, you know, used in relation to three wise uh, monastics that were practicing in the Buddha's time and it was said that their practice was strong and they actually ended up um, attaining Nibbana, the highest goal of practice, by practicing in a way that helped them to view one another with kindly eyes. They cultivated this beautiful disposition towards one another, always with hearts of gratitude, feeling how grateful, how wonderful, what a great gain it was for them to be living with other virtuous people on the path. And they would regard one another with kindly eyes. So we can do that to our experience, no matter what we feel. Yeah. So we're going to approach this practice in those two main ways, and also strengthen that innate capacity that we all have um, by being clear about the benefits of loving-kindness, which we'll talk about much more, and as I say, making that cho conscious choice to cultivate the practice of loving-kindness, not by forcing ourselves, but by being very patient, very gentle, and persistent. You know, there's a kind of energy and, uh, and, and persistence that is gentle, but it doesn't easily give up. And this is what we're looking for. We're not looking to force anything. We're just looking to have a sense of consistency about the practice. You're not giving up so easily, giving things time to, uh, to bloom, but just being content with planting the seeds. And as I said, we're going to use um, thoughts in a certain direction. Um, both in public and in private. 
So not only do we have kind of kind thoughts about people when we see them or say kind words to them whenever we have reason to speak, but we also cultivate those thoughts even in our own personal space. And that includes towards ourselves. So even those things that we can't see we're doing, you know you're doing them, right? You know that you're speaking to yourself in a mean way. <laughs> so see if you can have the same kind of behavior that you'd have publicly, even in your own mind, in private. We're also going to learn to, as I say, direct the mind towards the experience of loving kindness. It's a little bit beyond anyone's control as to how far that will go. Sometimes loving kindness can be experienced simply as a kind of softening of the body. You know, a sense of spaciousness, a sense of relaxation or ease. Sometimes there can be a sense of warmth, especially around the chest, or it can be in any part of the body. Sometimes a tingling <coughs> around the top of the head. Sometimes there's a sense of buoyancy or lightness. Sometimes it's very quiet, it's very peaceful. It can manifest in different ways. And these are not really the important things. The strength, the intensity is not as important as a kind of steadiness an emotion that becomes increasingly stable and trustworthy so that it saturates our experience. We feel um, that there's something here we can rely on. We're having this sense of well-being, ease, contentment that is becoming stable. This is uh, what happens when that loving kindness starts to develop. And sometimes it's somewhere else than we're looking. We're looking for bliss, we're looking for bright lights, or whatever we're looking for. But it's so important to look at what's there, not look for what's not there. <laughs> this is a mistake we make throughout our life, right? We're looking for something, some kind of happiness that we actually don't have right now. Or we're looking for happiness in the future, which doesn't exist, and we're missing what's there right now. So if we can start to tune into that, then we get a familiarity and an ease with that emotion of loving kindness. And we allow it to resource our hearts, to resource our minds, so that we can start to trust it and settle the mind. And this is how the mind starts to settle into deeper states of samadhi. Yeah? Samadhi is always, uh, samadhi means like um, stillness or a kind of sustained awareness. It's a state of mind where things start to really uh, come together. The mind isn't scattered or dispersed anymore, but it's starting to have this inner kind of steadiness and trustworthiness that we can increasingly let go and um, allow the diversity to start to drop away and the mind to start to unify. Yeah? And samadhi is always brought about through happiness. And it's the happiness that's a peaceful kind of happiness. So loving kindness is very potent as a way to enter those samadhi states because it's naturally joyful naturally blissful. And also, it overcomes the five hindrances, in particular the hindrance of aversion, but also hindrances like fear. You know, maybe it's not literally classified as one of the hindrances, but restlessness, remorse, even anger is often a cover for fear, right? And loving kindness is used in the Buddhist texts first, the first time the Buddha taught it, to help some monks overcome their fear of the tree spirits who didn't really want them there because they hadn't actually developed enough loving kindness. So the tree spirits try to frighten these rogue monks who are probably full of you know, unwholesome thoughts and scare them out of the forest. And the Buddha said, practice loving kindness, then go back again you know, to overcome your fear. And then it worked. And then they could be there without any disturbance at all. So it starts to help us overcome these hindrances to meditation. And in that way too, we're able to enter the deeper states of meditation. And then, it doesn't matter how far you go, so don't feel that this is like something that you have to kind of attain. The whole practice of metta, of samadhi, of virtue as well, is a practice of letting go. It's a practice of relinquishing, of giving, of allowing things to be and being generous with things, rather than trying to acquire, it's like learning to be really content with what we have and to give our attention, give our time to the practice, see the qualities we can bring rather than what we're going to get. And then lastly, towards the end of the retreat, I want to talk about um, how Metta is specifically helpful 
for the practice of wisdom? What particular insights tend to come around through the practice of loving kindness? Because there are certain insights that become very powerful through the practice of this. Often related to uh, the way perception works, seeing that uh, malleability of perception, how differently we see the world when we have a mind of loving kindness compared to a mind that is small and brittle and full of ill will. You know, we literally understand how we create our world. So this is roughly what we're going to be doing. And um, I guess, first of all, I want to emphasize uh, the practice of mindfulness for the first evening and also uh, as a kind of ongoing practice throughout the retreat. But certainly we'll focus on that this evening and also tomorrow morning to just... Um, get a little bit of clarity about what's happening in our body and minds. You know, they've probably been busy and, you know, working too hard, not sleeping enough, if you're anything like me, <laughs> dealing with all kinds of different challenges in your life, at work or in your family, or, you know, even getting here, navigating the transport systems, international flights, etc., etc. And our poor old minds are just beaten up and tired. So first of all, we're going to focus on really um, allowing the mind to settle and just bringing up a bit of clarity in the mind and um, getting to know our minds the way they work without any judgment at all, as far as we possibly can. And also adding that kindness to the way that we're aware. Okay. So... I think I've spoken more than I intended, and I don't want to go on for too long. I was going to say a little bit about the schedule. Would that be helpful at this point? Yeah? Okay. So, let's have a look. So, basically, the schedule is going to include um, group meditations, which will generally be in silence. So, where it says group meditation, that usually means... A silent meditation, but there will also be some guided meditations, probably including the meditation after the morning Dhamma talk. And uh, so, do you want me to literally read it out one more time? Would that be helpful? Or just talk in general terms? Who wants me to literally read it out? No one. Great. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> I can get to bed sooner too. All right, so um, the schedule again is an invitation. I'm sure that for the sake of the smooth running of the place and also for everybody's comfort and quietness in the hall, it's nice to try to be in here on time if you are intending to join the set and stay until the end. But if you find that your body is just not up for so much sitting in the beginning and you want to do more walking meditation or if you want to lie down, I have no objection to people lying down in here, I think there's a fair amount of space. You could perhaps move towards the wall or see that you're not sort of poking your feet too close to someone's head or, <laughs> you know, just to be careful. Also to make sure you leave enough paths so that people can get to their seat. But I am completely fine with that. And um, just see that, you know, you try not to nod off and start snoring. But sometimes if the snoring's not too loud, I actually think it's okay to leave people a little bit because in the first couple of days you're going to be tired. So take the rest you need. Take this as an invitation. If you don't feel like getting up, I personally don't mind. Um, yeah, this is the way I'm trained, to allow the meditation to happen. You know, because I think if we force it and if we expect too much of ourselves, then we approach it in a way like it's just another job. It's just another pressure we put on ourselves. Um, but of course, it is a beautiful protective container that works. And so if you are able to join in with most of the schedule, then that's great. Um, we are co-creating a safe and friendly space together and every single person here is a valuable and important member of this community. No matter who you are, no matter your colour. I wouldn't even say no matter, I'd say especially because of your colour, your sexual orientation, your gender. Whatever it is that's unique about you is beautiful and is what creates an incredibly open and welcoming space. 
So I'm always really happy to see diversity among spiritual communities. I wish there could be more. Um, but no matter who you are, you're welcome fully in the body you're in and in the particular um, yeah, gender expression that, that feels right for you. So it is a safe and friendly space. And the beautiful thing about the loving kindness practice is it will become increasingly so with time. Uh, so even though we're in silence, as I said, it doesn't mean that you cannot smile, you can use your eyes to smile as well, but you don't have to. If other people might want to be really eyes downcast, and I practiced like this for the first 15 years of my practice, especially in the long retreats. I know some of you have done retreats with Goenkaji. I used to do like the 45 days and the 30 days and all, and you used to just look down the whole time. So all you knew of anybody were their shoes. And you didn't know whose shoes they were. You just saw that a uh, shiny sandal person comes in the morning every day at four o'clock. Oh, look, clog person comes ten minutes late. Except you wouldn't know unless you were ten minutes late. And then at the end of the retreat, you'd actually match the people to the shoes. It was fascinating. But it was also quite intense when you actually raised your eyes and suddenly all this sense input. But it can be helpful, you know, sometimes. If you don't go too tense with it, it can be really helpful just to give yourself that sense that you're allowed to be alone. I find that really beautiful, you know. I'm allowed to be alone and no one's going to kind of come and approach me. I can just kind of hide. I can just kind of disappear. So if there are people who, who want to be in that space, that's also really encouraged and really welcome. Uh, another way that we can offer silence is by walking really quietly. Uh, I think it was Pamela this afternoon who said that her friend was like, uh, would walk around like as if there were a ghost and she would try and be even quieter than that. Um, in Perth, where I spend my men's retreats every year, we, we practice burglar meditation. So you have to imagine like you want to rob this place. <laughs> you don't really, okay? So don't imagine it too seriously, but... Imagine if you were going to, would somebody hear you? Probably. So you make yourself so quiet that, you know, you, nobody would even notice if you left or if you stayed. So this is not to make you tense, you know. And on our side, we try to be considerate. On our side, we put a lot of care into this out of jo the joy of it, the love of it, being soft, really getting our mindfulness sharp as to what we're doing, how we're moving, etc. But from... Other people's side, from our side too, I guess, if other people make a noise, then we have to give the benefit of the doubt, we have to give the forgiveness. So no matter what's happening, we can generate consideration or we can generate forgiveness and understanding and um, not being so judgmental because sure enough, you won't always be quiet, right? No one will. Uh, so yes, we open doors quietly, we tread lightly. If you have really alar loud alarm clocks, maybe put them under your pillow or something so they don't wake your neighbour. Um, I'm going to get on to the bit that you probably don't want me to get on to pretty soon, which is technical silence. <laughs> You're going to put your mobile phones to bed because they're tired too. I swear, <laughs> they're really tired of doing all that work for you. And if there's any way that you can relinquish your phone for the next six days, it will be of immense support in your retreat. When I started meditating for the first 20 years at least, I never saw a phone in any monastery or retreat centre. And later on I just thought, but that isn't a retreat. You know, when I heard that on the last day even people were looking at their phones, it was just mind-boggling for me. Yeah. Now, of course, it's become normal to have them even during the retreat. And I think it deprives us of so many opportunities for deep practice. It can seem like such a harmless thing to send a little text or just to check, but it opens a whole world up that you're trying to put down just for this time. And if your family are understanding, you know, if you have told them that you're being on retreat, you're going to be in silence, let, give them the chance to support you in that. Give them the chance. You know, they might find they appreciate you more when you haven't spoken them, to them for six days. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that you will appreciate them a lot for giving you the peace. So, of course, as we said, you know, if there's someone that you need to be checking on from time to time, that's okay. Maybe put your phone in your car and try and be really disciplined. Have a particular time that you check. Um, give them the number here, etc. 
so that messages can be relayed to you, and they will be, you know, they really will. But most of the time, the world doesn't stop for six days. So now is your chance. You just don't know if you'll get this chance again. So I really do encourage it. And I think a box is going to appear tomorrow morning. I don't know, maybe before breakfast, maybe after breakfast too, to give you a last chance to put your phone to bed. You can wrap it up if you want and go in there, give it a kiss. <laughs> anyway, yes. So see if you can do that. And, you know, we're all here to support one another. The staff are here to support you. I'm here to support you as best I can within my energetic limits. And um, there's going to be a question and answer session every evening. And that is going to be by note. So the good thing about that is you have to be a little bit clearer about your question. It can be a bit more to the point, a little bit concise. Uh, there's less chance of you sort of making mistakes in your speech. But mainly, the reason, the main reason, is uh, so you can ask absolutely anything you want without any inhibition at all, because I won't know who has written the question unless I take your question back to my room and analyse it against your form, <laughs> which would make me a very weird teacher. <laughs> you might want to yeah, put me out of a job. So, <laughs> so no one's going to know who wrote the question, and it can be completely anonymous. The other nice thing is that many questions sometimes are the same, there's no such thing as a stupid question, but there is such a thing as a question that's asked many times, and then I can amalgamate that and give a more generalised answer and try and include elements of the question. Um, so try and keep them to the meditation, but if you want to ask something else about practice that's not been particularly addressed in this retreat, that's okay as well. So um, really anything goes, and I don't mind if you send me a joke or something either, it's up to you. <laughs> And from not tomorrow but the day after, the early rising day, <laughs> we're going to have, uh, if you wish to rise early, I, don't, I think you'll probably make it for breakfast, right? <laughs> so, uh, from then we're going to have uh, group discussions at uh, 10.30 till 11.15. We've called it group practice discussion rather than um, interview um, because it's really a chance for you to just express what's happening for you. But it's not an opportunity for the group to talk to each other. It's not that each person will give some input for you so that would break the silence, right? It's more the case that we hold a really beautiful safe space where everybody feels able to just speak and as they speak the listener tries to practice right listening listening with non-judgment, with compassion, staying embodied, noticing any response that might arise, and just giving that person space. So we'll have that every day as well. Um, but obviously it's a big group, so each person will have one opportunity. And I've tried to stagger it a little bit in terms of experience, but not absolutely, because there's just, it's just, you know, on the whole, the ones with a bit more experience will come later on in the retreat, and the ones with a bit less will come first, okay? Doesn't mean that you might not be more advanced than the ones with more experience, but it's just for the sake of organising the names. Um, yeah, so I think that's pretty much everything. The main takeaways are to really, for the first while, listen in to your body, listen in to your mind, see if you can develop that loving companionship, treat yourself like an ally, be an ally to your body and mind, be a friend, and um, just gently follow the offerings as best you can with gentleness, with persistence, but without any force, and give things time to develop. You know, you've got all the time in the world, and just enjoy the beautiful opportunity you've given yourself, because it's a very precious and rare one that doesn't come about very easily in this world, so... I think that's enough for now. Are there any questions before we do a bit of meditation together? Again, it can be anything practical or about the retreat. Yes? Um, do you mind saying a couple words about yourself? Oh, of course, sorry. Yes, I should have done that right in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> A couple of words about myself. Would you, what would you like to know in particular? Since 
how you started your journey in Buddhism. Okay. And right. Till now. Oh my goodness. Well, that could be another hour-long talk. So I'll give what I think happened. Um, so I was born in England, uh, in a small town in 1975, and um, I had a normal childhood, whatever that might mean, but there was no sign, really, that I would kind of follow a path like this. My family weren't religious, in fact, we were really not religious. Um, but then in my teens, I had this very, I guess I'd always been very questioning, but in my teens, I had a, almost an urgent desperate sense that I needed to find out why I was here. I needed to understand the meaning of my life and um, what I was doing here, basically. And also I had a keen sense that there was a lot of suffering in the world. It was just, it, it hit me, it really affected me, you know. Because as I say, there wasn't so much that was difficult in my own life, but even just watching the news was like pretty hard hitting to see the way human beings can treat one another. And I just felt a kind of very acute sense of needing to know why we suffer and how to live a meaningful life that would be in some way a response to that. But I couldn't articulate it really, very clearly. So um, together with my best friend, we decided to go to India when we were 19, <laughs> kind of partly for, as a spiritual search without me being able to put words on it, but also as rebellious teenagers that just needed to get away from this kind of bubble that we were in to understand something more about life. So um, I went to India and it was there that I discovered Vipassana meditation. So that was the meditation taught by Goenka, S.N. Goenka. And the retreats are 10 days of silence where you're just alone with your mind. And uh, it took me a couple of years of being in Asia, traveling, doing it all, <laughs> no holes barred. It was, uh, it was my freedom in a sense, the first taste of freedom away from, you know, parents who I thought were too controlling. And, uh, and it got to the point where I just wanted to understand what was going on in my mind. So I sat that retreat and uh, everything that the teacher talked about was, were things I'd always intuited for myself, but I, again, I couldn't find the words. Um, yeah, in particular, that there is so much suffering. And that there's a reason for that, and there's a meaning to that, and there's a path to the end of it. And for me, that was the biggest relief. And I felt that, yeah, I found my path. So it was very, um, I don't know, maybe a strong calling, but it was very immediate. It was something very deep inside resonated with the practice and with um, the teachings of the Buddha that now I kind of, I can put stories to it, but I, I can, I do think it can only be explained by past lives, really. I mean, what was a 19-year-old girl from a small town in England doing in India and then deciding to spend the rest of her life following that path? So it's funny when people ask about my journey because I'm very aware that I'm putting a kind of conceptual story on it but I think it's a bit more mysterious than that. Um, and anyway, I spent the next seven or eight years in Asia, working where I could to come back and keep practicing. And I served a lot of retreats, like a lot mm. of retreats. And, <laughs> and then I ordained in Myanmar in 2006. So that was 10 years after I began my practice. And I was searching for a monastery the whole time. But... Uh, there just weren't any opportunities, very, very few opportunities. So I was kind of preparing myself and searching for a place to, to practice all that time. Uh, so that got me to my ordination. And then after a few years in Myanmar, I got very sick. I still have a chronic gastric um, condition from that time. And uh, discovered my now teacher, Ajahn Brown, through some little recordings that I heard when I was there. And uh, on a leap of faith, kind of went out to seek him as my teacher and uh, ended up in Australia, where I took full ordination in 2014. And uh, a couple of years after that, he asked me to go back to England <laughs> and start a monastery in England. So this is how I wound up in England again after many, many years. And now I'm uh, running a charity there that's aimed at... Uh, developing a monastery where women can take uh, the training towards full ordination as Buddhist nuns, as bhikkhunis, 
and there isn't such an opportunity yet in England. So after eight years of working on that, we now finally found a property. And we started from nothing, so we've been fundraising, teaching, you know, really hard work for eight years. And when I go back uh, to England on the 20th of March, we're moving into a monastery, <laughs> a property that we've just uh, found in England uh, to start that monastery. So that's my life story in a nutshell. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's been uh, varied, I would say. Started off with a, yeah, a normal kind of life in rural <coughs> England, then a lot of meditation, and then a lot of work to make a monastery. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? How about anyone else? Are you all comfortable? Do you have what you need in your rooms? And yeah, you know where to go and what to do. Very good. So I would suggest that we just have a little stretch uh, because it is already more than an hour that we've been in here. And then we can just do maybe half an hour of meditation to just land together before having an early night. Mm -hmm.